Britain might be taking us to them elsewhere. Um, I'm really resting on this table about safeguarding concerns in the various columns. So when I compare the numbers of concerns raised with the population of the districts, I'm juggling figures like are uh, really people in Wirral more willing to complain, less willing to complain in Nosley, is it something about accessibility to services? Because when you do a quick sum, it's like one in 200 in Nosley, one in 100 in Liverpool and Sefton, and yet it's one in 45, if you look at the number of complaints related to our population in that age group. So working through on the basis that we're trying to standardise this, or at least come to a common rationale for it, to see if there's a comparative basis, I'm a little anxious that we would be losing uh, because we've got a high proportion of people willing to identify or willing to come forward, is some assurance that in ironing out these differences, we're not going to miss out on things that people might have raised. Sure. Really <laughs> um, what that shows is um, it's, it's more about the practice at the front door of the authority than actually. Um, so, for instance, in Nose, it looks very low. But, um, Everything comes in to that, uh, it did come into the front door, I'm sure Graham can explain. Everything came into the world front door. So if you had anyone who was concerned about a care home, anyone who was concerned about anything, it came in there. And in other, other age authorities, they had different teams actually in different, different areas and they were, they were passed on to them. Do you want yeah. to explain? So for example, um, uh, correspondence from the police, um, they uh, send information through for people that have been dealt with. All of those uh, were not triaged or counted as a safeguarding issue. Some of those needed acting on some of those things. Uh, other information coming through via the um, uh, one stop shops, someone comes into the one stop, stop shop and says, My father is struggling at home, uh, needs an assessment, that will come through to the safeguarding team to be sorted. So there's a lot of stuff that was coming through into the safeguarding team that wasn't to do with safeguarding. So what other areas have got is they've got um, those staff that are working in these places have been trained to understand what constitutes a safeguarding issue and what constitutes an inquiry. It's as simple as that really. So what we're doing now is filtering out the difference between safeguarding issues, inquiries and things that need to go to another agency or whatever. So I think what was happening is we were overcounting the number of inquiries as safeguarding. And then what you'll see is the actual number of safeguarding investigations was far lower than those, those inquiries that were coming because we were simply not triaging. We can tease that out when we come up through the next next years. And, the, and to give you assurance that the outcome of that is that whoever's coming into the front door, whatever front door will get the right place quicker. That would be that's the purpose of doing this piece of work. Thank you. Since then, it's been um, 
over the, over the year. The studies were an operational base in the, in the area for partners to talk together about what's happening to embed the learning from the board. But in terms of the board, in terms of shared learning, better use of resources, hopefully more impact when we actually do actually do a campaign or something. It, it, it feels so it's working. Yeah, so, um, in essence, four boards all around me all at a set of cost. So again, the police four times asking for further funding for the boards we were going to, uh, and they were being asked to attend four boards so they could uh, buy a recipe. Um, and then um, we were duplicated, so each board would be in very similar way, but in a slightly different sort of way. So bringing it together, A, in terms of um, joint learning, would gave us the ability to start uh, what good looks like. So I think that, that's been absolutely the key benefit. Uh, it's an, enabled us to pull upon a broader set of brains in terms of all of the people working all the four authorities rather than you know, each one doing their own thing. Um, but actually it's been really cost effective. So we're all providing staff to cover each of uh, the boards and all agencies contribute to the cost of those staff. So we're all made of saving um, uh, several hundred thousand pounds. But um, that, was, that was on the basis that what we could do is offer a service to other areas rather than just providing that service for Wirral. So it, it's been, you know, and, and those other areas don't need to have those arrangements in place in the same way. As Sue said, the uh, local executive or operational people still need to, need to have that localised partnership. But uh, the board are able to look at things in a much bigger sense. Um, and so it's been incredibly valuable in terms of because obviously children's a slightly different, it's a different arrangement. Yeah, no, it's really sort of Sorry? Yeah, it's sort of no, but I, I can see the benefits of having, um, you know, uh, 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 the, the, the learning from a, a range of authorities all around the table at the same time. I can see the advantages of that. Okay. Alright, so thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Right, okay. Um, so, item 5.2, um, again, uh, unfortunately, Paul Boyce, uh, <coughs> Director of Children's Services, is, is not able to be here, he's poorly at the moment, so, um, again, I'm going to suggest we defer that presentation to the next time, yes, okay, we can go all right with that. Um, so that then takes us to uh, Healthy Wirral and ISO 6.1 is the NHS 10 year plan. And Simon, you are going to take us through this please? So we're just in a short presentation of what's uh, the 134 page document. So the document itself is, is, is widely available. Um, it's just to really think of what is, is flowing through um, the, the NHS long term plan um, is an increased focus on the place. So it's probably, I'd say, the second most important document the NHS has done in my, my career in health and care over the last 25 years. I think that the, the uh, well, probably third, if you count the NHS and community care in 1990, probably the NHS plan of 2000, uh, this comes very close. I think it's because it can, it's a continuation of the work of five years forward of you, but then um, with, with a lot more um, rigour around it in terms of deliverables and a lot more um, sense of um, direction and purpose and as I said earlier, as, as it emerges, it focuses on place. And I think where this sits within uh, Wirral and, and certainly having been to one of the Wirral Vision 2030 events this morning, um, it, it, there's a real opportunity in this about how we operate as Wirral. Um, as a health and care economy, really, which we'll, we'll draw out. And I think that's, that's why it links very nicely into the remainder of the agenda. So hopefully, this is going to work. So the plan was actually published on the 7th of January. Um, it had been ready for a couple of weeks before that, but needed to uh, have a government approval for it um, being set out. This forthcoming financial year 1920 is very much a transitional year. Um, there are short term operational plans, there's changes in the financing structure, um, there's some specific must do's, but they're all about getting the NHS and um, health and care in its wider sense on track in terms of the reform agenda over the remaining five years. It was originally called the 10 year plan 
and because um, it, it is going to take a long time to, to do some of the activities in, included in there about the shift back to primary community health services, the greater focus on prevention. Um, but very much if we don't deliver that in the next five years, um, with the funding settlements being given for the NHS, then we've, we've really lost the opportunity of a lifetime to redesign how health and care are delivered um, absolutely in the widest sense. So as Healthy Wirral, we've, as it says later in the, the papers, we're producing a, a system operational plan and then starting to work on a system sustainability strategy. That's rather than Wirral Health and Care commissioning to producing a plan, Cheshire Wirral Partnerships, Community Trust, Wirral Hospitals, etc. We're actually bringing that together um, and acting as one. So the, the first um, real thing is actually this is about a fundamental re redesign of how we do business as an NHS in the 21st century. Digitalisation through that online GP consultation, the great use of the NHS app. Um, redesigning outpatients, so actually you only go to see somebody in an outpatient setting if they need to lay hands upon you. Um, so actually the greater use of technology uh, to convey test results, etc. to provide diagnosis. Bringing GP practices increasingly together in networks of integrated services on 30 to 50,000 populations and making sure that the community teams and other services wrap around that. And in rural, our ambition is beyond just health and care, it's about wrapping services per se around communities. So we started our journey around neighbours thinking about 80% of this was health and care and 20% of the other. And actually we've flipped that substantially. This is about building community resilience. It's about avoiding the need to access health and care. It's all the things we discussed this morning in the Wish Wirral Vision 2030 event. Um, it's also about supporting people living in care homes. That's the last 100 days of people's lives, largely. And two million people are then uh, not ending those lives in a, in a safe and comfortable way in, in an environment that they're choosing their end of the hospital settings unnecessarily. The extension of actually more choice and control for people through things like social prescribing. We have a really good social prescribing offer on Wirral, and this gives us the opportunity to build upon our community connectors, upon our personal dependence coordinators, upon people who actually are not necessarily health professionals, but actually get reduced health gain through putting people in touch with the social networks and other services that the NHS and health and care doesn't necessarily provide, but benefits from. There's going to be greater investment in primary medical and community services, so actually investment of roughly about £2 million for we're all for next year, additional into primary care. Um, there's also a mental health investment standard, which uh, we will meet as we're all, um, so that increases services around mental health conditions, um, but really also looking at reducing pressure on the emergency care system and looking at new clinical standards around stroke and other critical illnesses. So just a reminder of our rural neighbours which will appear in the health of the documentation. These are 30 to 50,000 population. They're based upon where people live, where people work, where they're educated, where they have their leisure opportunities, where they identify with. Um, so this is getting away from um, almost where the NHS has got to, where you come to us. This is about where health and care comes to you. And recognising, I think, increasingly um, there needs to be a mindset change about the, the health and care is there to serve the population, but equally the population is there to um, um, have, an, have an element of responsibility themselves in terms of their, their life choices and we're there to support that. Um, <coughs> the five year forward view chapter two was quite, um, had quite a lot of aspiration around prevention and health inequalities and I think forward uh, ten year plan, long term plan takes that forward. So actually we're looking at the things we've always looked at about cutting smoking and pregnancy and increased focus on tackling um, alcohol as a, as a cause of illness or of obesity as well. Um, but also a greater focus on narrowing health inequalities and people in this room know what the health inequalities are within the world, but actually going back to that neighbourhood approach enables us to target resources and effort more into the areas based upon their particular inequalities. So um, if we just go back up, we know for example um, that we have higher rates of 
uh, respiratory um, illnesses and conditions in Birkenhead A and B compared to West Wales, so we may want to be looking at attacking those inequalities in that part of the world through more dedicated and targeted respiratory interventions. But there are also clearly um, societal-wide issues around obesity leading to type 2 diabetes. Um, there are issues we need to tackle with the local authorities around air pollution, which are things like no idling zones around schools. Um, they are also, uh, also linked to that. So this is again about encouraging partnerships at a local level. Um, and more, very, very pleasing, a greater focus on ensuring people learn disabilities and or autism get better support when we have a growing need for services for young people, particularly with autism um, within world. Further progress on care quality and outcomes. There has been some debate recently around changing some of the constitutional standards around access to services, but there will remain constitutional standards for access. But also, this is also about outcomes. Um, there's continued focus on improving access around mental health services, so access to psychological therapies, um, diabetes screening programmes, and so on. But this pleasingly extends us to a greater focus on children's health, and maternity and neonatal services, and also preventable cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. It allocates, in the view of um, the regulatory body, sufficient funds on a phase basis to increase the number of planned operations. So we have had an increase um, in waiting time. Refer to your packs now, I think, because it's just dying. Um, there you go. Back again. It does that from time to time, I believe. So um, what we have a need to do is actually ensure that the planned operations that we're putting through the system are appropriate. So people are still being over-treated within the NHS, we're still putting people um, too late into the system. So actually more preventative measures, more services like we have locally around muscular and lethal services, which actually reduce the need for, I suppose, hands-on surgical care and other interventions. Um, greater focus is on community and crisis services, not just now for adults, but also children and young people in mental health services has been a national scandal that we are placing many, many people far, far away from where they live in terms of long-term placements. And a lot of work is now being, has been done around learning disabilities, about repatriating people to the areas where they live, and through the Transforming Care Programme. Um, and Graham has been very, very close to that in terms of our local work around that. The same may needs to apply with equal vigour to adult mental health placements, and those are children and young people. And again, in partnership with Cheshire, we're all a partnership, we're making a good strides around that. And these are all about changing that service model in Chapter 1, linking it to clinical improvement, and actually changing the overall system architecture, so just focus on where people live. And taking some of that, that work also beyond. There's also a greater focus on, on workforce. So we will have and do have the workforce challenge going forward. Um, we want to make the NHS a great place to work, we want to make sure that people have high levels of health and well-being and we bring forward the talent of the future as well, um, that we retain people within health and care, um, because it's actually a really, really tough place to work at the moment. So this is also about a new wave of um, workforce in terms of the social prescribers, in terms of clinical pharmacists and others, but also increasing the numbers of people in traditional health care roles. And much of this responsibility um, previously, I, I think, was sitting with um, health education in England, and much is now going to be devolved to local areas, and actually that means for us in Cheshire and Merseyside um, and the North West footprint. Um, we do have within the Healthy Rural Programme a workforce stream. Um, it's chaired by uh, the sponsor for that stream, Karen Howell. She's also the sponsor for that across Cheshire and Merseyside. So again, we're looking at initiatives um, around encouraging apprenticeships, encouraging new, uh, new people to come into the workforce, retaining people at, on, on a local basis, as well as playing into the, uh, the regional and national pitches. Digital is very, very big. Um, there's some must-dos within that, but given that uh, the Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock, is very, very keen on all things digital, um, it's really important the NHS starts to catch up with digitalisation in society. We've not been exactly doing an early adoption of many of these, these
these processes and, and, and applications. It's about, um, and I think, however, on World, we're in a really, really good place because of the work we've done with World Care Record, we've done with Cerner and Population Health Management. So the purpose of digital is to make it better for patients in terms of access to information um, and smoother flows to the system. It's better for clinicians, so actually they don't have to carry around lots of notes carry things on digital devices, they can communicate with one another across the pathways across the system so the GP can talk to the hospital specialist and vice versa. It's about us having a greater uh, understanding of the needs of our population and actually doing something about that in real time through proper population health management and a proper robust IT infrastructure um, that actually is, is safe in terms of cyber security and cyber attacks. As, uh, we have been suffered um, last year. So very much, I suppose, designing the, the offer, whilst conscious there, is, there are people who are on digital deserts or people who are not digitally enabled, there is a large cohort of society who are now digitally enabled and we need to be prepared for them to be coming through. Um, in terms of chapter six, it talks about um, taxpayers' investments and maximum effect. Um, Revenue will grow by 3.4% in real terms over the next five years. Um, but as uh, Simon Stevens said in the room the other week, um, this is not a sugar rush for more of the same. So the money um, comes with um, strings attached. It comes with the need to make better use of that investment. Um, one of the five tests is that. So first test is return the system to financial balance. So the bridging money to the 1920 are really about getting the provider sector into a position where they have the chance of balancing the books. Um, that comes with risks to the commissioning part of the sector. Um, but then actually all systems having recovery plans where over the next five years they not only improve care, um, so they deliver better health, um, they deliver better outcomes, but they also make sure they deliver that within the available budgets. Um, and within available resources. There's also about product, therefore, dealing with in terms of productivity, so actually looking at how we uh, use, reduce bank and agency costs, um, so we make best use of the workforce we've got, how we get procurement savings, how we deliver items, things such as pathology at scale, um, we take administrative costs out of the NHS, so um, clinical commissioning groups are expected to take 20% out of their administration costs. Um, NHS England and NHS Improved through the merger also taking similar amount out. Um, and these are both uh, organisations with low administrative overheads. I think ours is about 1% um, as a CCG. So we're taking 20% off of 1% over the next couple of years. Um, within Wirral, by coming together as Wirral Health and Care Commissioning, we've made many of those efficiencies and we make the efficiencies in how we commissioned. Uh, and manage the system as well. So I think we're in a very really good place in that. Um, but also making, in those productivity, is making better use of assets and estates. So there are void spaces in the NHS estate that we need to actually fill with clinicians or clinical services, or look at asset and estate which could be used better across the piece. Um, so playing into rural growth company, playing into um, the economic regeneration opportunities as a public sector, we could potentially release land or buildings that could be used for other purposes that create social value um, for, the, for the wider community. Um, the third test and the fourth test are actually linked to, ch to the chapters I spoke about earlier. So actually, this is about reducing growth and demand through integration and provision of care. Again, on Wirral, uh, we've transferred the social care staff into healthcare providers, so we have more seamless uh, multi ready teams um, we work better in terms of integration of, of commissioning and therefore we commission more effectively. And the Healthy World programme starts with the premise of acting as one in order to achieve clinical sustainability, better outcomes and financial sustainability. But equally reducing the fourth test is reducing that unjustified variation in performance which is back to eradicating long waits for 18 week referral to treatment, making sure people with cancers are seen and treated on time making sure that people are treated quickly, appropriately in accident and emergency. So this, as I said, is, is resource with um, strings attached about a sustainable financial path to the future and service improvements at the same time. 
The next step to so the NHS 7 is being created. The uh, NHS England are currently um, out to a consultation on uh, any change to the legal framework. We are doing this within the auspices of the NHS and at the Health and Social Care Act of 2012. So acting within the existing legislation, some of that legislation prohibits um, and fetters rather than actually enables. Um, there is the creation of integrated care systems um, uh, by uh, April 2021. And absolutely a key role we're working with local authorities in place, which is access to what we're actually trying to do um, with Healthy Wirral. Um, NHS England and NHS Improvement, as Nikki's report later on uh, in the agenda sites, are also coming together. So, legally under the Health and Social Care Act of 2012, you have to have an NHS Improvement, you have to have an NHS England. So, providing that they are, uh, there's, there's a way forward that has been found between the two regulatory bodies where they can come together, have a single chief executive, which is, is Simon Stevens have shared regional teams um, and therefore that makes our job a lot easier about having a case about how we work the systems because historically um, commissioning side has been subject to assurance and guidance by NHS England and the provider side by NHS Improvement and they haven't always been on the same page. However, we have noticed certainly in the last 18 months or two years um, that has changed significantly. In the last few weeks pace of change has been intensified and certainly from the beginning of April um, we will have a shared management team um, and that has really strengthened us in terms of having discussions about our recovery trajectory with, with one set of people. Um, I'm not really gone into much detail on the appendix but if you actually do well, take the time to read the NHS long term plan, I think the appendices are just as exciting as the main problem. Because it talks about the NHS as an anchor institution, it talks about our role in encouraging employment. We are, we're all one of the biggest employers um, within this health economy. Most people live here as well, so uh, our population are also people who work for us. Um, and there is a role we have which links back to the uh, chapter on um, employment about making ourselves attractive rather than people working in another. Um, other uh, parts of, of industry here or, or ever, for keeping them, recognising there's economic uh, gain to be had by that, and making sure that we do our procurement as far as possible locally. There's also uh, a role around health and the justice system about bringing keeping people out of prisons and making sure that uh, we keep them in terms of uh, their good physical health. There's a renewed focus in terms of veterans in the armed forces about that transition period when people leave the armed forces, um, which is often a very, very stressful time after you know, years in, or, you know, whether it be several years or several months um, in one of the, uh, the uniform services, it's often difficult for people to readjust. So there's going to be a great focus over the next few years about developing services for veterans. Um, care leavers. Um, Paul, if Paul goes for here today to tell you about the challenge you have around care leavers. Um, this afternoon we had a presentation to the World Health and Care Commission team about the social value work being done by the council and the opportunity this is offering for care leavers um, to find employment and the economic and social return on that. And there's much more we can do about supporting care leavers to find employment and maintain your levels of mental and physical health and well-being. Health and the environment is a really um, <coughs> exciting one for me. So you heard me mention about no idle zones on the side school. There's a real strong link in a number of areas, real golden threads in this report. And respiratory services are one of them. So if we can improve respiratory um, management of respiratory conditions, we reduce the elective emissions. If we can do that by reducing levels of pollution, we help the whole of society. And also, if we then move people to inhalers that are not aerosol based, um, then the NHS as a whole reduces its carbon footprint. There are many things within here which are actually interlinked with that. And finally, this important part for me the NHS, um, Health and Care of the Anchor Institution. Um, I was saying to the, this afternoon the days where the public sector 
does everything on and gone in days of the gold resources we have on and gone, but increasingly we have to be the enabler um, and broker of solutions. Um, and we remain an anchor institution. We still have high levels of trust to the public. Um, and we need to en ensure that we are there in terms of an anchor within Wirral uh, and playing in all other parts of Wirral as well, which is why Healthy Wirral is utterly linked into first the Wirral Vision 2020 and then in, in future years into Wirral 2030 as it develops. So our next steps, we're currently working on that operational plan. Um, it's going to the Healthy Wirral Partners Board next Thursday. Um, and then we've got the five-year system sustainability plan, which, um, having spoken to, to, to Councillor Davis and to the uh, current chairs of the two scrutiny committees, we would want to do some work with the full council and also the respective scrutiny committees through workshops and eventually final scrutiny reports, so they can we can understand as a system and um, how this is being developed. We are keen that whilst this has to be aligned to national priorities in Cheshire Mental Health and Care Partnerships, it also reflects our other local priorities and asks. So it reflects the, the need to, uh, to uh, improve children's services, for example, and, and, and actually sees Wirral um, as a system. And we will be using the Healthy Wirral Programme approach, which comes up, as I said, as a paper later on, um, to guide us to that. And actually, just to keep people on that path of acting as one um, and doing what we do for the next system benefit and recognising actually this is for the benefit of people living and working in rural rather than individual organisations. Thank you, Simon. And there's the, uh, the links if you want to see what the other details. Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, <coughs> so, questions, comments? Oh. Mm. Wrestling with this one, and everyone can shoot me down or whatever. Um, <coughs> we strain every set of you, strain every city with us to try and get the system back on sort of financial target and eliminate deficits. Um, looking at the figures I've seen in some reports about the, the reported difference between income expenditure for the hospital trust or whatever, looks like enormous banking. So, what I'm trying to understand is going to be sort of Straight every single, as I said, because that's the most medical way I think of to actually achieve it. But I'm trying to satisfy myself that in trying to do that, we don't actually cause damage to a system when there might be some money coming over the horizon. So we take steps now, which are really tough, to try and get things in balance, and perhaps we'll get regret them later on. That's one issue that's crossed my mind. The second one is our ambition. And the leaders now going, but in the sense of the world can envisage, say, three and a half thousand houses extra by 2020, and the next stage of the world plan, because I couldn't go to recent meetings, may, depending on the, the uh, inspectorate, the planning inspectorate, public inquiries, and governors, what well, leaders to having X number of houses somewhere and a growing population. So, how does the funding that we get from various sources? Um, how would that be uh, adjusted or applied as our population rises to healthcare? It seems to be there's a lag. We have to some, prove to someone on high that we've got more people before we get so much per head for the local surgeries and people on the books. I'm, I'm just trying to work out how I understand how it works in practice. The one thing that people say to me about all these new houses is well, you know, where are they going to live? We get that one if the properties are there, but where are they going to go to the doctors, the dentists, and will really it have more pressure to the health service? So, those are the things that people got in their minds. Yeah. So, your first one about um, not taking measures that actually may have short term gain but longer term pain, mm. that's why we're working as the system is healthy. Rural. And what we have had is a payment system. Um, which was fit for purpose at the time about where you paid for activity, but then generates things like the upcoding of activity. So our issue is not necessarily the level of activity, it's what we're paying for it. So, and it's also back to the acting as one. So if we can agree to act as one, actually it's really important to have optimised clinical pathways. It's, it's more important to have fewer handoffs for the individual, which is, I suppose, one of the, one of the reasons around the integration of the health and care staff as we have at the moment. 
there are efficiencies within that. There's also better patient care. Um, the, the transference of responsibility more to the individual as well is the less is done onto them. Um, and the redesign of the system also means that if you have, for example, with, without patient redesign, you're not seeing people that, you know, appropriately just to come and say you're okay. Um, the redesign of urgent care is also about not admitting people um, and finding alternative sources. And I think at, at, at scrutiny last night, you also, there was about 370 or so additional extra care housing units coming into the system. So that's again another lever about um, maintaining people in their own homes or a home-like environment with, with appropriate care around them. We do have recalculations on a regular basis of our funding which is based upon uh, a variety of factors. Um, the calculation for that is done by somebody far more, more mathematically gifted than I will ever be. Um, and it was explained to me before Christmas um, by, by one of the guy from NHS England who was leading it. Um, but the funding formula has changed and we have benefited a little bit this year because of the funding formula change. Um, but that then will be, it's recalculated on a fairly regular basis to reflect democratic demographics and growth and other things like that. Um, the fact of the matter is we are given a amount of money by Parliament each year um, and the local authority um, has a certain amount of revenue it can generate and allocate to in care services as well um, and that's what we now need to start to live with them. But where we've had the conversations before, they've not been joined up, they have been about um, Commissioner provider rather than actually everybody in the same room working for the benefit of all. Um, we do have to remind one another from time to time what we're there for. Thank you. Yeah, Julie. Yeah. I think um, your comments around um, developments is, is a good one, Councillor. Um, I think there is something about how the NHS and the Council work together around the local plan mm -hmm. because there is a uh, Forget what it is, but there's a section something or other that you can apply to developers for local services. And I think a look for a conversation around <coughs> development with the NHS would be really welcome so that we do make sure that the developments are contributing to the local development of the infrastructure. Now, when it comes to general practice and, and pharmacists, then they are the numbers that we have locally are calculated down in London and I don't believe that we are classified as an area that's under doctored or that we're under with regard to community pharmacists. Um, but that up front conversation I think is really, really important so that we can link in community developments alongside perhaps new developments for example. Just to come back on that one because I've rambled many times at council about us not having the community infrastructure levy in place even with the notice of motions on it, but we can't have the community infrastructure in place till we've done the exercise about the zones as to the cost, what it will produce to each zone of the borough, uh, because the borough was in several study areas. If you go to Cheshire East, they, they think they'll get about £10 million from community infrastructure levy over a decade. Um, and so we have to get the local plan sort it out and the consultation with businesses before we can start charging community infrastructure levy. Um, uh, and so I'll leave that one hanging in the air for RQC and other people because we have to get those ducks in the line. I thought it was actually something before... Well, section number sec 6 was more related yes. to a specific development, yeah. if you could prove it, if I remember right. Yeah. But I, th I think, for me, it's the conversation uh, mm -hmm. because I don't think we're having the conversation. So there is a big push through the NHS plan around uh, the NHS being an anchor institution mm -hmm. playing its part in the place where it operates and I think it, the instruments that we're talking about sound like they might be useful but actually there's probably a lot we can do in the interim if we just talk to each other rather than do our, our planning in silos. Mm. Okay. No? Okay. Thanks, Simon, for taking us through that, uh, <coughs> that plan. Okay.
We then move on to the Healthy World, World Programme updates, which is you again. Yeah. So, uh, I'll, uh, um, I've got my senior responsible officer, the chief executive of the Healthy World Plan uh, hat on at the moment. David Eva, uh, to my left, is the independent chair of Healthy World. Um, I'm presuming people have read the report, I just, uh, and I think it covers some of the ground that I've just covered about our plans to produce um, and agree a one-year operating plan for 1920 as a system, but then actually in more detail, how are we going to recover type of uh, plan over the next five years. I believe that in terms of the regulatory bodies and the Cheshire Motor Health and Care Partnership, we have um, a significant degree of support for that. And we've been seen to try to do the right things and to do the right things in the right way, um, which is quite important, I think. Um, the programme governance, which uh, I think the board received an example of before, I said I'm, I'm the SRO, David is, is the chair. Uh, we've just gone through in the last um, few months a bit of a change around our programme governance. We, we recognise actually the programme needs to be more aligned around. Um, place-based health and care systems that we needed greater and uh, more effective scrutiny of what was happening within the programmes at a senior level um, and that the governance processes were much simpler. Um, so what we're, we're doing is, is changing that so there's more, as it says on the top of page 78 in the diagrammatic there, uh, a more portfolio-based approach with neighbourhoods being very, very key. Um, because they are a system of architecture change um, to the delivery of, of some of the main programmes which, as it says, they are urgent care, mental health, women's and children's learning disabilities, plan care, medicines optimisation which is about uh, prescribing effectively but also ensuring that people are um, we're reducing waste in, uh, and so on. Population health which is about ensuring we have the right data uh, to commission from and input, we also understand the outcomes and also in that non-clinical transformation which would include our work around uh, estates, uh, digitalisation and so on. So that's where we are in terms of moving on. But as it says, the fundamental component is the development of the neighbourhoods and primary care networks. And um, practices are in the room this afternoon um, and it will be one of several meetings they'll be having between now um, and the end of April about how they can start to fit around and work better together around those neighbourhoods. Um, there's a bit of explanation there about how we're going to change the programme. Um, we're looking at um, introducing some more programme support. At the moment, the programme runs on a part of my time, uh, a secondment from the Community Trust, which the system uh, supports, um, which is Julian Eyre as the programme manager, David um, as the chair, and we also have a, uh, an ex-chief, uh, ex-finance officer providing support. Um, we've also paid for some support from Mersey and Ten Audit, and the rest is actually the goodwill of the system. Um, it's the, some of the people in the room today. We do need to socialise this to be the day job. We do need to socialise this to be what we need to do. But sometimes, actually, the other pressures um, of the system uh, sometimes divert us. I think um, neighbourhood development is late on the agenda, so I won't touch upon that and ground we talked about, but there's a significant amount of work in those neighbourhoods with the third sector, which again goes back to that place model, which is beyond the traditional health and care. Um, there's also some pieces there about some specific work we've been doing on um, frailty dashboards, on 